Hello everybody, this is Alex Merced, a developer advocate here at Dremio, and here's the video I promised we're going to be doing an Ask Me Anything on Apache Iceberg. So I posted on Facebook earlier in the day, I posted, I made this post, Ask Me Anything, uh, and I'll try to do this more regularly on different topics, um, where you can post a comment and I'm going to answer it in this video. So that's what I'm going to be doing in this video, but before we get started, Again, I'm Alex Percent, I'm a developer advocate here in Dremio. Along with following me on LinkedIn, you can also follow me on Twitter here at AM Data Lake House. So if you don't follow me on Twitter, please do so. And just so you know, every week we do a weekly broadcast called Gnarly Data Waves, where we talk about all sorts of great data lake house topics. This week we'll be talking about how Maersk is building a next gen data lake house with Dremio. Okay, the following week we'll be doing Apache Iceberg Office Hours, uh, talking about simplifying data governance at scale. Um, you know, so we're gonna have a lot of great topics that you can enjoy over the next several weeks. So do tune into that. You can also subscribe on anywhere you'd like to listen to stuff like YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, you'll be able to find Gnarly Data Waves there. Okay. And again, if you didn't watch today, uh, me and my colleague Depankar had done a talk with Seattle Data Guy uh, Ben uh, Ragujan um, about Apache Iceberg. So if you didn't listen to this talk yet, uh, go give it a listen. Right again, go to the Seattle Data Guy LinkedIn page, watch the talk. It was a great discussion about what is Apache Iceberg, use cases for Apache Iceberg, uh, just the whole Apache Iceberg environment. So do check that out. Okay, now with no further ado, let's go through the questions uh, in the Ask Me Anything. Okay, so first one, how can I delete a row using a nested column as a filter using PySpark SQL? Okay. So bottom line is, you know, it depends on what kind of nested column it is. Are we talking about nested in a struct, nested in a map, nested in an array? Okay, which possibly could be an array of structs. So basically, bottom line, when we're talking about struct values, the format's going to be basically the, the field that is a struct, and then you access the individual columns using a dot notation. While if it's a map, okay, we would then do the field that is a map and then put its key in square bracket notation okay and if it's an array we would use this array contains function and then say hey which field has the array and what value are we looking for in that array and that's how you would do so using uh, the spark sql syntax okay when you um, want to delete or re or filter or whatever inside of spark sql okay cool so that's there i'll leave that up there for a second if you, anyone wants to pause and look at that for a second Okay, cool. I am using Athena to create query iceberg tables. When I am querying using proper partition, iceberg still sc uh, scan almost all the data files inside the partition. Querying using proper partition, iceberg still scans all data files inside that partition. For example, I have a date as a partition and underlying schema has uh, an ID. You know, when I select query MPID from iceberg, table where MPID equals ah, boo, this query scans 17 gigs. Even if I remove most of the ideas from the ink clause, still scans the same amount of data. Uh, but how Iceberg can scan, scan data across files in a partition and what techniques we can all use for skipping data. Um, again, this could depend on the specific query engine. So I don't know about the ins and outs of how specifically AWS Athena is doing uh, scans on an Iceberg table. But what should be happening is that the query engine is going to first scan uh, the snapshot. So it's going to get to the manifest file, which for that particular snapshot that you're querying, and it's going to have basically a bunch of different manifest entries. Each manifest represents a group of files, and each manifest is going to have stats. So like, what are the partition column values that that particular uh, manifest covers? Um, in max, um, you know, a bunch of, bunch of stats, particularly the partition column stats. And based on that, you can skip chunks of data files by saying, okay, well, n based on this particular query, and again, the question is like, is the query filtering based on the partition column? Okay, it'll say, okay, well, based on this filter is saying, hey, you're, let's say we're talking about height. You know, you are querying every, everyone in the date in the table of a height of five, okay? It's going to exclude any partitions that wouldn't include a, a, a partition value for the height column, if that's the partition column uh, with a height of five. But let's say you did a secondary um, filter where you said, okay, well, not only is their height five feet, but I also want to filter out people. I'm, I'm also looking for people with uh, an age of 10, but that's not a partition column. Okay, so after it filters out all the different manifests uh, based on the partition column, you're gonna have a bundle of manifests left that lists a bunch of files. 
Okay, and then it's going to go in there where it'll look at column level statistics and only retain, only scan the files that have, you know, someone with an age of, that would cover anyone with a sort of an age of 10, I think was the number I said. That's technically how the Aquarian engine should be scanning the files. Okay, now things that could possibly cause problems here is one, the query itself, it doesn't actually scan the columns that, that were that were necessarily queried, because then what's going to happen is I won't do any partition pruning. It should still skip the data files based on min max values, but it'll take longer to do that because you weren't able to get rid of just whole partition, whole manifest based on the partitioning. Um, so thus you still want to take advantage of the partitioning and not just rely on the, the file level uh, min max filtering. Also could result in how the data was written in the first place. Um, in older versions of Iceberg, not the newest one, the newest version changed this. Okay, um, there is a property called sort of a write distribution mode. And what would happen is that if you were to write a bunch of data partitioned um, to, to Iceberg, uh, it would have a value of none. So it wouldn't do any kind of distribution work. So essentially what would happen is that in Spark, you're, you are creating all these tasks and each task is essentially being signed, is going to end up writing its own files per partition. So basically, if there's a hundred possible partitions, okay, there's theoretically possibly a hundred files that are going to be written for each task, assuming that they have at least one record that falls into that partition. Okay, so then you just end up having uh, a lot of data scattered across a lot of records. Okay. Um, also, again, if, if you're filtering based on other things that are not partition columns, also just the way you have your data sorted. So you might have like a single record, okay, a single record that is in a, a file. So what happens if you have at least one file that matches your query in each file, then it's going to scan the whole file, okay? I mean, theoretically, once it gets to the parquet file, it can then use the row groups in that parquet file to do some further predicate pushdown. But again, that depends on how big your row groups are in your parquet files. Um, so I would take a look at any of these levers. Take a look at like your specific query and... Is like, okay, am I querying the partition columns? Um, two, if I'm not querying the partition columns, is my data sorted and how is it sorted? Um, and then how my parquet files are written, as uh, far as like predicate pushdown for even further sort of filtering action. But theoretically, assuming all those things are in check, you should get the more performant uh, uh, queries. So, you know, if the, if the table's properly partitioned, properly sorted, and all that, uh, and there's still performance issues, then there's probably something going on in maybe engine settings or something like that. Um, because otherwise it should be pretty performant. Uh, is Iceberg better than Delta Lake at detecting schema evolution? If so, right now I don't think there is any built-in ways for Iceberg to detect schema changes that I'm aware of. Uh, another question that's gonna come up is gonna talk about this and we'll talk about sort of, you know, uh, a way of handling schema changes, but right now I'm not aware of a built-in sort of schema change detection thing. And that probably such a thing would have to be a service in a sense. And again, the thing about the Iceberg project is that generally like the ice, the core Iceberg project doesn't create its own services. Okay, generally any services around Iceberg, you know, are created externally. So for example, like the Nessie catalog, that's a service that you would run if you want to use Nessie as a catalog. So that way you can have like versioning on your data lake and things like that. But it's a separate service. It's out, it's, ex, it's exterior to the core Iceberg project. Okay. And then there's like, you know, in the Iceberg project, it's just the spec. So even like when it comes to inside the project, there's only a catalog REST API spec that catalogs, that catalogs can use for interop. So whether a catalog is open source or proprietary, they can commune, you can create sort of a, a standard way of communicating to a catalog using that REST API spec, which is how I think like, uh, um, well, one, it's how tabular in you interface with the tabular catalog with any particular uh, engine that supports the REST catalog, um, but also like Snowflake, it's catalog integration. So that way you can talk to other catalogs is mainly through that REST API from what I understood at their talk from uh, Snowflake Summit. Summit. Okay. Um, so again, it's not an implementation, it's not a service, but people can create services that use that as a method of communication. So chances are any kind of schema detection would you know, it's since it's it's active. It sounds like something that would have to be actively. It's it's a process, so it would have to be part of a service. Like maybe in the future, there's a function 
built into Iceberg that allows you to more easily detect schema changes that you then manually run in your code script, but then it has something that automatically runs a service that has to be created. And I think this is like where people get a lot, like really confused when they're comparing like Hoodie, Delta Lake, and an Iceberg. Because Iceberg tries not to bill itself as, doesn't bill itself as things it's not. It's a spec and it has tools for helping people use the spec. That's it. Okay, and it doesn't really go beyond that. Okay, and it lets everybody else kind of build tools around that in an open way. Now you go to the other project. So you have like, when you go to like Delta Lake, there's a muddying of where the lines are because what happens is that there's a lot of services that Databricks provides. Okay, and oftentimes are presented as if they are part of the Delta Lake spec. Sometimes it gets really confusing. It's like, okay, when, which features are available to Delta Lake as a table format versus me using Delta Lake with Databricks because Databricks provides these additional services. Like probably one of the, the most recent one being like the liquid partitioning thing that, which is a service that's, it's, it's so, because again, a pro, it's a process that's con, cur, it runs concurrently with your querying uh, for it's kind of redoing your partitioning. But that's not necessarily a feature of the format of the spec of how Delta Lake works. It's a process. It's it's a it's a computable process that occurs para, you know when you're operating. Okay, and I, so basically you can have things like that. Okay, so like table management, like things like like Dremio Arctic, which does table optimization features, Tablet, which has table optimization features. You know, uh, have different optimizations. They run in parallel, but they're not part of the spec. They are a service you run with your iceberg tables, okay? And it's a very clear distinction. And then with Hoodie, you have the Delta Streamer, which is part of the Hoodie project, but it's not necessarily part of the table spec. It's a service built as part of the project to help to provide a lot of those things. But again, whenever you have a service involved, it means it's a thing you have to manually deploy and maintain, okay? Um, so the idea is kind of creating that clear line of hey when is this part of like how the mechanics of how the format works versus sort of like a service that i deploy so that means i have to you know create another you know uh, ec2 instance that has the software deploy that's constantly running and has all the right permissions to communicate with all the other other machines to con to to do and the right file systems to to do this parallel process okay um but again, and a lot of times you can deploy these services on your own or you can use parallel services. In the case of Databricks, like those services are built into the Databricks platform, which makes, which again, is probably leads to a lot of the confusion between sort of like Delta Lake as a standalone table format versus like Delta Lake on the Databricks platform, because where do the services end and the format begins? Um, it's oftentimes a state of confusion. A new feature gets announced and you're like, oh, that's cool. And then you try to use it outside of Databricks and you're like, oh, okay, that's a service that Databricks provides. Which again, that's fine if you use Databricks, it's just sometimes very confusing and not always presented in a very clear way. Okay. Um, Iceberg just avoids being in the service game and allows vendors to be part of that, to provide that. So that way it's very clear. Iceberg is just the spec, it's just the, the, the sort of agreed upon rules and how the data, the metadata is written how you read, how you, I mean, the, the reading, the writing, the services around it, all is really part of the ecosystem with competing implementations and things like that. Okay, that was a much longer answer, <laughs> but uh, that, that's the deal there. Okay, how do you do a merge operation on an iceberg partition using specifically df.write? Okay, so here we go. So basically you could just use Spark SQL, there's a, there's a there's support for a merge SQL syntax with Iceberg, but this specifically said using df.write. So here's sort of an example of how you could replicate what a merge does. It doesn't perfectly replicate it, okay? Because essentially what the merge into command is doing in, in, in Iceberg is doing something a little bit different than what's necessarily possible in just plain like PySpark code, okay? So it what you can do is gonna be more similar to the uh, insert into override command in iceberg and technically it would work sort of like this okay so what you do is you will create a data a data frame out of a table in uh, from our staging data then what we're going to want to do is take um, you know our staging data and then we're going to join it with our existing iceberg table 
and try to discover sort of like, hey, which basically what's the delta between the two? So basically, uh, a join where we only have only include the fields that don't the rows that don't match, since we know that those have to be inserted. Okay, and then we do the same thing where we try to look for the ones where they're the same, because those are the ones that would have to be overwritten. Okay, and then you would just do two commits, one that's an append commit, okay, that appends the new rows, and then you would do another one that overwrites the rows that are the same so with the with the new values. Again, not exactly quite like exactly what happens mechanically as with the merge into command, but far as I can tell, this is probably as close you can get just writing imperative PySpark code. Um, cool, okay, next question. Uh, when using Spark to insert data into Iceberg, how to handle schema changes before insert? So I kind of alluded to this before when we are talking about schema, uh, detecting schema evolution. Um, like let's say you have some new data coming in, but it's using a different schema than the table currently has or vice versa. Is there, you know, I mean, other than just doing, doing normal data validation, is there a way, is there a built-in way? No, I mean, that would probably involve a service because that'd be sort of a computational process that occurs, not something that's, you specify, it's not a spec, it's not in the realm of a spec, which is just saying, okay, the files should look like this and the, 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 the data in those files should be organized this way and they should relate to each other this way. It's, you know, opining on how the computational process should go on in, 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 the, in the read and the writes. So that would, you know, generally entail some sort of service. Um, but, you know, if you want to, in PySpark, run some code, and this is pretty much saying is what he's like already doing. So basically here he's saying, okay, the data frames can be step validated and then you do an alter table command. You can do that. Here's some code that's kind of a version of that. Okay. So here we have the existing table saved as a data frame. Then here we have the incoming data as a data frame. And then what we're doing here is we're running a uh, basically a diff on the schemas. Okay. And that's gonna give us sort of any changes in the schema. Okay. And then what we're going to do is then we're going to um, run a loop over those schema differences. Okay. And then basically drop them from the original table, add them to the original table. Again, this is just an example. You may not even want to necessarily drop the old field and just add the new field. Um, there are reasons you may want to do that to, for consistency of previous data files that might depend on that existing uh, field. Okay. But you might have something like, you know, you might do something like that. You can do that in PySpark. And then after you're done, you just then go write the incoming data to the table. Um, so that's an option. But again, is there a built-in way? Not that I'm aware of. Can can you build something to do that? A service that will kind of do that? Uh, that is probably, I mean, I guess that would have to be done on the right. So that would be part of the sort of your, your write, your ingestion scripts. Um, I mean, you could theoretically build, someone could build a library that could be used that. Maybe in the future, there's going to be better built-in functions in the Spark libraries for detecting schema changes. I'm not aware of one off the top of my head. But again, I don't know every method for every class in Iceberg uh, off the top of my head. Okay, can you provide examples of how Iceberg works with the Snowflake database? Um, I'm not as in-depth my knowledge of Spark with Iceberg. I mostly work with, uh, you know, I mean, Iceberg with, with Snowflake. I mostly work with, like, engines like Dremio and Spark and Flink, um, but on the data lake house side. But from my understanding, when you think about Iceberg and Snowflake, the old Snowflake Iceberg story was you had a feature called external tables. And external, the external tables feature would allow you to use sort of a generic query engine um, I'm not, you know, I think, I guess they implemented sort of just sort of this general use engine that allow you to, to query formats like Delta Lake and Iceberg. Okay. But it wasn't very performant because, you know, it, there's, since there's different types of formats, instead of trying to create all the optimizations you could for every possible format, it was just like a generic, okay, I'm going to go read these things. And that's that. Now, Iceberg, Snowflake has now since more... Uh, in, in basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but made a greater commitment to Iceberg. So now Iceberg tables fall into one or two categories. They're either an unmanaged Iceberg table, okay, which is managed by a third-party catalog, which could be like a catalog like 
uh, AEW's Glue catalog or the Nessie catalog, which you can get as a service via Dremio through Dremio Arctic, which is another topic I'd love to talk about. Um, and then you would connect via the, and then they, they use the, the REST API interface uh, that open spec. So any, any catalog that implements that open spec and then basically be used with, with Snowflake essentially. Um, and then two, they have managed tables where Snowflake has its own catalog and then those tables. So basically if it's an unmanaged table, it's read only with Snowflake. Um, and then if it's a managed table, it's read and write with Snowflake. And because it's their own catalog, you could theoretically connect that catalog to, to other engines. Okay. Uh, so you get, so then it becomes externally available, uh, outside. And this is where a lot of people, everyone's trying to kind of come up with their own, uh, catalogs because that's you know that is sort of the next big foray into into the ice in the iceberg world because basically the what you use as your catalog is basically really determines a lot of sort of one what features what tools you're using um whatnot so you know i think everyone is sort of standardizing on iceberg at this point and now the question is which catalog because i mean lake fs just came out with their own catalog uh, a few weeks ago um, you know, I'm a big believer in open standards, which is why I'm a big fan of the Nessie uh, um, catalog, because not only, not only is it open, in a sense that it's open source, like the Re the REST catalog is an open spec, the Nessie catalog is an open implementation of a catalog. So basically, not everyone has to kind of come up with their own implementation. They can just use this open implementation as they see fit, because it's open source. Um, but you, there already is a service you can use to like just get an SE catalog really easily, and that's the Dremio Arctic service, and which allows for you know automatic table optimization, allows for versioning, so you can version your catalog, so that way if you have a bad ingestion job on several tables, you can just roll back your whole catalog, in, in a, pretty much at a click of a button. Um, you know you can tag your whole catalog to be able to kind of capture the state of multiple tables all in one tag instead of tagging each table individually. Uh, it, there's a lot of benefit to that level of abstraction. Um, and there's a lot of really cool things that are kind of on the roadmap for that open source project. I highly recommend people looking into it and Hey, even contributing, con uh, contributing to it. There's always room, uh, you know, for more hands on every open source project. Right. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I'll try to do more AMAs in the future. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, make sure to, Check out Gnarly Data Waves. So again, dremio.com slash Gnarly Data Waves dash data dash waves. Okay, and again, tomorrow we're going to be talking about Maersk and how Maersk has used the Data Lake House to save a lot of money and create a, a lot of cool things. So that's, again, every Tuesday we do that. If you want to attend live and be able to ask and participate in the Q&A. Okay, and otherwise, just, you know, follow me here on LinkedIn. I'm always trying to post cool, useful stuff, not just in the Iceberg and Data Lake House world, but, you know, this week I'm doing, I think this week and next week, I'm doing a series on data quality uh, checks in SQL, so make sure to see that. And then I should have a blog coming out in the next couple of weeks on that same topic that'll show you how to do data quality checks, not just in SQL, but also in Polars and Pandas, um, and lots of other really cool blogs that I've written that you can find all at the dremio.com slash blog. Have a great day and enjoy us. See you all later.